Hello and good morning, everyone. I'm gonna just wait a, another few seconds to let everybody in our audience get here. Okay. So good morning, my name is Mimi Scheller and I'm the Dean of the Global School at Worcester Polytechnic Institute. We're very happy to welcome you all to the third in our series of Global School events. This seminar today is on applications of generative justice in Sub-Saharan Africa. And our aim is to build off of our whole series of events to, that describe our ongoing work and projects and partnerships, in this case, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And we see all of this work that we do as a way of overcoming the challenges and difficulties in the relationship between Western science and technology 
as it has historically impacted and shaped the region. This session will demonstrate the WPI approach for engaging the Sub-Saharan African region in all different kinds of aspects of science, technology, engineering, scientific applications, and technological innovations. We try to use a relational approach which brings peer-to-peer -peer partnerships, cross-cultural co-design, and economic projects that support host communities. The highlight of our program to today will be a keynote presentation on innovation and development by Leonard Wanchikon, who is the James Madison Professor of Political Economy at Princeton University. This will be followed by a series of lightning talks by many of our faculty and um, participants in our global programs who are doing transdisciplinary work in Sub-Saharan Africa. And to ground that discussion, we will then offer a video montage of projects led by students from our new program in science and technology for innovation in global development. Recently tweeted this fact, the main character in season one of Golden Girls are younger. Someone has to mute, okay. Sorry about that, thank you. Um, so before we begin, I just wanna say a few words about our global programs. The Global School, along with the Provost's Global Initiatives, carries out research on the frontiers of basic and applied research, education, and outreach. We wanna thank the Provost's Office for supporting these initiatives and this event. Professor Rob Kruger, who is the ad, uh, interim head of the Department of Social Science and Policy Studies is also the director of the Provost's Global Interdisciplinary Initiatives, which includes the Institute of Science and Technology for Development, amongst others. In 2020, WPI organized the first international conference in development engineering, which took place in Accra, Ghana. And that event was also about examining the role of both Western and non-Western forms of science, technology, and innovation in Sub-Saharan Africa. We're excited that in 2022, instead we'll be hosting the second conference on development engineering right here in Worcester, Massachusetts. Professor Kruger also directs our joint BSMS certificate and MS program in science and technology for innovation and global development, which we'll hear more about today. This is a transdisciplinary, cross-cutting, campus-wide collaboration between a number of departments, including social science and policy studies, biomedical engineering, biology and biotechnology, chemical engineering, chemistry and biochemistry, data science, humanities and arts, civil and environmental and architectural engineering, as well as management, and of course, integrative and global studies. This program focuses on technology and development in low and middle income countries. And we work to combine technological and scientific innovation with cross-cultural design thinking to address pressing challenges and create positive social change. So we take an approach that promotes self-sufficiency and pushes beyond the transactional concept of an end user to the more pluralistic concept of community co-design. And that's something we really try to highlight in many of our programs. So we're delighted to have Professor Wanchikan joining us today. And I am now going to hand over to our two introductory speakers. And we are also delighted to have with us WPI's um, Distinguished Statesman in Residence, the former ambassador of Ghana to the United States, Ad Barfuar Ajay Barwua. And this is a new position which has been launched under the auspices of several programs within WPI to support universities global initiatives. And former ambassador RJ Barua has been engaging with students and faculty through the SSPS department in the School of Arts and Sciences and with the Institute of Science and Technology for Development. He will be giving us some opening remarks followed by our own Associate Professor, Beton Somasi. So thank you for joining us and I'll hand over to them now. Um, 
Well, good morning, everybody. I suspect uh, I'm the one who is supposed to be making a remark at this time. And uh, I take the opportunity to welcome everybody. Well, Sub-Saharan Africa has been through being called backward, has been through being called developing, have been through being considered third world, and whatever epithet that we have been through. All of these have actually meant that somewhere along the line, we were not seen as keeping pace with the rest of the world. The West African story or the Sub-Saharan African story is bound to change. And indeed it is changing. And by its own programs over the past few years, by its attitude, and by the fact that the institution has invited me here as a distinguished statesman in residence and a member of faculty, the WPR has tabled the intent to help change the Sub-Saharan African story, economically and socially. And I do believe that on the basis of what the WPR has been doing up till now, the WPI has signed up to make sure that there are significant changes on the African continent, especially in the Sub-Saharan region, to reflect the intent and also the future of that area of the world. And my signing up as a member of a faculty and as a distinguished statesman in residence I have obviously registered my intent to support and indeed to find a way of being central to the BPI's effort in Sub-Saharan Africa. The fact of the matter is, we are a growing region. We have a very young population with a voracious appetite and with the kind of skills that need sharpening for us to be, be, to be able to survive really as a productive region on the planet. And for me, I have the intent and the will and the expectation that I will make an effort to lead the BPI's effort in this regard. We are launching our program in Accra, Ghana, in a few weeks time, because we are using Ghana as either the point of origin or a node for the effort to spread the BPI's you know, competence, the BPI's support, and the know-how that is going to be necessary for us to bolster the developmental effort in Sub-Saharan Africa. I'm confident that with the BPI's determination, with your participation in this uh, in her seminar, you are also signing up to support the effort. We are going to be counting on uh, businesses and individuals in Ghana for starters, because somehow Ghana also has to have a sort of skin in the game. But I'm also going to be counting on support from the United States, organizationally or individually, and the African diaspora to make our intent real. I also take the opportunity to welcome all of you and expect that you will, by your action, by your donation, by your encouragement, support me and support the BPI in making sure that our program succeeds in Ghana and then also spread to the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa. Good morning.
Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Beton Somase, and I'm an associate professor uh, of economics at WPI, in the Department of Social Science and Policy Studies. Uh, my research is at the intersection of technology, uh, economic theory, and data analysis. It is my great pleasure and honor to introduce today's uh, keynote speaker, Professor Leonard Wachiko. Uh, he is the James Madison Professor of Political Economy, Professor of Politics and International Affairs at Princeton University. His research focuses on political economy, development economics, and economic history with a regional focus on Africa and on substantive, substantive uh, topics such as democracy and development, uh, education and social mobility, and the long-term social impact of slavery and colonial rule. Because I also happen to have a, re a research that focuses on Africa as a regional focus, uh, I had the opportunity in the past to meet and interact with him at many occasions uh, at international conferences and academic gatherings. And I know that we are lucky uh, to have Professor Wanchek on with us to this morning. As an academic entrepreneur, he is the founder and president of the African School of Economics. Uh, and he's also funded the Pan-African Scientific Research Council, for which he's also the president. Finally, our keynote speaker is a fellow of the American Academy of Art and Sciences, the Econometric Society, the Bureau of Research and Economic Analysis of Development, also known as BREAD, and research affiliate of the National Bureau of Research. Mm -hmm. He serves as vice president of the American Political Association and he is the executive, he is on the executive committee of the International Economic Association. Today, he will be speaking on the topic, innovation and development in Africa, the role of academic entrepreneurship. Please help me welcome Professor Leonard Wacheka. He will be speaking for about 30 minutes, and then we will follow with about 10 minutes of Q&A. So I strongly encourage all our participants to type in their questions as they arise, so that we don't forget anything. Um, please again, welcome Professor Wacheka, who will be sharing his screen and get started. You are still unmuted, Professor. Okay, so can you hear me? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks uh, everyone for inviting me and thanks um, uh, Beton for um, such a generous introduction. Um, it's my real pleasure to be here and um, I'll be speaking to you uh, about uh, innovation and development in Africa, the role of academic entrepreneurship. And my presentation will be based on my own research, particularly the first part, where I'm, I'm going to be talking about the role of um, human capital externalities, education in particular, uh, in development, and then followed by uh, my own work also on uh, academic entrepreneurship with the creation of the African School of Economics, the Pan-African Scientific Research Council. And hopefully I'll um, uh, end by presenting ways in which, for instance, WPI can engage with the uh, academic community uh, in Africa. Um, so um, human capital is very central um, uh, to growth and, and it's clearly uh, one of the key concepts in economic research. And recent groundbreaking work have shown that what determines regional variation in development is education. So, um, but it's not 
the average level of education that is critical is the upper tail of educated entrepreneur rather than institution and technology that the main source of productivity growth and development. It's the upper tail, it's the most educated that in fact creates the opportunities for others and generates an increase in the average level of human capital and ultimately uh, development. So, so to summarize, it's essential to understand that the most educated are the key to spread the benefit of education to the economy and to other individuals. But it's also, according to this research, important that at least the most, um, I mean, the larger part of the most educated turn into various forms of entrepreneurship. You know, so development is not sustainable without entrepreneurial human capital. So, um, but in aggregates, Africa lagged behind in science and innovation. So the frontier knowledge need for development is clearly lagging. In 2007, compared to the global average of uh, over 1,000 researchers per million, there are only 164 per million in Africa. You know, while the, con the continent's contribution to high level of global research is only 1.1%, substantial research on Africa issues being produced outside Africa. For instance, Ebola research is carried not in Sierra Leone, basic science in HIV, not in South Africa, malaria genetics, not in Mali, but instead in California, Oxford or Zurich. So among the top 141 publication in economics, only five have, Africa, have African quotas. That means only 3.5%. Yet, Africa has produced inspiring high caliber scientists who are the testament to the potential that Africa holds. So for instance, my colleague, uh, Professor Alji Busso Dieng, uh, a Senegalese artificial intelligence researcher who make major contribution to the field of generative modeling is now jo just joined the School of Engineering as the first black female faculty member. Uh, you can also uh, mention Bertin Naum, a surgical robotics innovator from Benin, who has founded the only European-based company that has received certification for its robotic surgical assistance. Or Fumi Olapale, an expert in cancer risk assessment, individualized, individualized treatment for the most aggressive form of breast cancer, who is the founding director of the Center of Clinical Center of uh, Cancer Genetics at the University of Chicago. And you can also cite Ibrahim Sisse, who is from Niger and uh, now a professor of physics and biophysics at, uh, in, at California Institute of Technology. So I, I, there are many, many, many more, okay? So what explain these weaknesses? So I can cite four factors. One is preliminary extractive research culture. So the fact that most of the research is done outside Africa, but those researchers, many of them um, do not contribute to the development of local knowledge, do not engage sufficiently local researchers. And besides that, you have a limited research-based universities and government funding, only 4.0.45% of government budgets invested in R&D. And there are a lot of private universities currently in Africa, but we don't, we don't, we are not involved in research at all. So, but then on the other hand, entrepreneurship is thriving in African economies. You know, 45 startups was set up, uh, you know, set up uh, on the continent uh, in 2019, has raised more than 1 million. And you find them in healthcare, in agriculture, solar energy, and governance. So now, what is the solution? 
what, how do we reconcile the potential of research in Africa, the need for innovation and cutting edge research in Africa, and, and also the fact that there are so many projects conducted outside uh, Africa that could push the frontier of research and innovation in Africa in a significant way. So the solution that I'm going to argue will be some form of academic entrepreneurship because development projects need to go beyond what I would call feeding the hungry and providing aid. It should engage, it should actively engage science and technology. And the way you channel this is through individual academic entrepreneurs. So you can do that through collaboration uh, between established university and institutes. Um, you can develop strategies to connect research with entrepreneurs to translate knowledge in development projects. And you can, you can make the connection between local and global cutting edge research institutions uh, to foster research and retain human capital because this strategy will help, for instance, limit uh, to some extent, the, the damage of brain drain, because there are opportunities for, uh, you know, cutting edge researchers uh, to stay and um, and do their do, do, and do their research. Okay, so um, now one wonderful inspiration inspiration for what I call academic entrepreneurship is Abdul Salam uh, from Pakistan. Um, who is a Nobel Prize uh, laureate in, th in physics, who has been really influential, not only in Pakistan, his home country, but also uh, the world of physics. So he is an example of an exceptional scientist, but also an influential academic entrepreneur. He created initiative for students, scholarships, networks. Um, he um, worked hard to set up, for instance, Space Upper Atmosphere Research Commission in, in, in Pakistan, working with NASA. But, but the most, for me at least, I think the most, um, um, and the most important of his accomplishment is the creation of the Institute, International Center for Theoretical Physics um, in Italy, you know, which is uh, a way, as I'm going to show in a second, uh, to bring when I was a student, oh, I'd write long essays that I'd work sorry, on sorry. for days. Sorry, sorry. I think I need to go to the next page first. One second. Um, yeah, okay. So here is a very short one-minute video on the Institute that I'm going to show you shortly. In 1964, Pakistani physicist Abdus Salam opened a door of opportunity for scientists from the developing world, the International Center for Theoretical Physics in Trieste, Italy. Today, ICP is a world-class research institute encompassing a wide range of physics and mathematics with a special focus on building scientific capacity in developing countries. We put a sample in between two mirrors with high reflectivity. Every year, ICP hosts over 60 conferences and schools on cutting edge topics. Thousands of visitors from around the world come to the center every year, making it a rich place for learning. We decided to study a dynamics of black holes in a large number of dimensions. It offers a range of training, educational, and degree programs that prepare students for future careers in physics or mathematics. So in order to write it down, I need to square. Established scientists from developing countries visit ICP throughout their careers, spending months here to refresh their excitement about science. So if you take any elements here, you can put it on a fiber, right? ICP's expanded international presence includes a network of five partner institutes that do regionally what ICP does globally. All of these activities support sustainable science communities throughout the world. That's the question. I see. From its research innovation to its unique international environment, ICP ensures a bright future for scientists everywhere. <laughs> Great, so this is a, a great example of the power of uh, um, academic entrepreneurship, you know, and in, among the accomplishments of uh, Abdul Salam is the creation of the Institute of Mathematics and Physics in my home country, Benin. That's how I got inspired by his work. So 
it, 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 you know, on the to, to build on this um, uh, a, a experience, uh, one of my first uh, accomplishments when I became um, faculty at Yale University and later on at New York University is to create the African School of Economics, which tried to do um, in economics and finance what um, you know Abdul Salam have done in physics. So. And it's a Pan-African institutions. And now with students even coming from outside Africa with uh, a very high level of uh, placement rates in a PhD program. So we have uh, you know, undergraduate program, graduate program in economics, statistics, computer science, and, um, and business administration. But then but my focus here will be on research. So uh, the, the, we, the, the center, I mean, the, the, the school, has five research institutes. We have conducted more than 45 projects in, in nine countries. And one of the most exciting part of the work we are doing is in biotech and agricultural science. Um, this is still not up and running uh, as it should, but um, we, we are on the way. So this will be um, a, a center in which we, are, we focus on biotech, um, in like plant biology um, training for, for farmers. And we will have different branches as you can see. And it will be a way to combine agricultural production, experimental farms with very cutting edge uh, research. And for this, we, we are working closely uh, with Princeton University. We also have uh, another center um, in, in finance, where we provide, uh, we created an app for tracking personal finance. We train people with this so that they can improve their incentives to save and they can be more easily eligible for loans from banks. So this is one example of uh, the kind of uh, applications of um, digital, uh, you know, digital, digital technology that, that we are using. So, but besides those two, we, we also have you know, research in applied economics, particularly education, political economy, historical applied micro, and our flagship project is a three years um, you know, education project financed by uh, the British development agencies. And this is happening in Nigeria. Uh, what is also unique about the, the school is the fact that uh, we are deeply involved in quantitative research in African history. So for instance, we are running this project on the social impact of the Amazons, which is um, um, you know, the institution of female warriors from 18th century to 17th century to uh, 19th century Benin. And this, this project has been covered by Washington Post and I'm currently collaborating with Hollywood with making a movie out of, uh, uh, you know, not out of, uh, not out of this project in particular, but some aspect of the institution of Amazons in Benin. So uh, we have partnerships, several partnerships around the world, you know, Princeton, Pasteur Institutes, and uh, many universities in, in Europe and, uh, and, and Canada. So now, um, I'm going to finish by talking about the Pan-African Science Research Council, which is um, set up to bring together a network of African or Africa-focused scientists and professionals who lead the way in producing world-class research and influencing evidence-based decision-making and innovation across the continent. It has uh, four uh, thematic areas, social science, biomedical science, energy, environmental, agricultural science, applied math, computer science, and statistics. And the goal are uh, mostly like four, four, uh, fourfold. First of all, it's an academy. So we want to highlight and reward excellence in research. We want to encourage interdisciplinary collaboration. We want to encourage evidence policy making through policy engagement. We also want to facilitate technology um, ad ad adoption. As I said, for instance, through the work that we are doing at the Institute of Biotechnology and Agricultural Science. Uh, at African School of Economics. 
So, and it's a very broad organization with more than 520 members. And, you know, from, from uh, you know, North Africa, East Africa, West Africa, Central Africa, and Southern Africa. Okay, now one of the, the key uh, institutions that we are establishing um, to be the operation implementation arm or wing of the council is the Entrepreneur Innovation Hub Africa Initiatives based at Princeton University. So that initiative funded by uh, the, the, the Dean of the vice, the vice Dean of Innovation at Princeton University will have uh, many potential activities like annual conferences with researcher, entrepreneur, innovators, a fellowship program for member entrepreneur to enable close interaction with researchers, and a platform allowing innovators, entrepreneurs from Africa, uh, their peers from the US, and the, the council research community to extend ideas and develop collaboration opportunities. And uh, fourth, to facilitate uh, IND partnership between the US corporation in energy, biology, social science, agriculture, among others, with startups and firms um, in Africa. So as you can see, um, uh, you know, we are doing we, we, what we, are, we work, we are, we, are, we are doing here at uh, the Council and also African Economics um, overlap quite a bit with the mission and the goal of uh, the WPI. And uh, I'm extremely excited um, to be here and, and to really not only share our experience, our vision, and see, for instance, the extent to which we can actually collaborate. So it's really critical, and this is the goal, the overarching goal of, that we are all pursuing, is to really create opportunities for knowledge production in Africa. Why? Because it's cost effective, because it built on the right local priorities, it's also more inclusive and it has potential to make major, major contributions. So, but then knowledge alone or knowledge creation alone is not the solution. It requires networks and opportunities for entrepreneurship and innovation. I'll leave it there. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Wachikan, for um, his inspiring talk. Um, you have spoken a lot about um, academic entrepreneurship and uh, how it can connect to making more, to, with research to make more impacts uh, at, at the society level. Uh, I would like to invite um, attendees and participant to type in the questions in the Q and A uh, box, uh, and that we will relay those questions to to the speaker. Uh, maybe to get a start off, I, I would like to maybe start the first questions. Um, in, in your talk, you 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 insist on the fact that uh, we need to go beyond projects. Uh, one off project, like you put it, uh, feeding the hungry, and that we need to go a little further if we want to achieve uh, more social impact. One of the things that we care about is uh, the idea of uh, social justice, and the theme of this conference is actually generative justice. So I would like you to, if you could speak to um, that idea of how um, academic entrepreneurship can help uh, in that direction or, or, or not. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. So um, two things. So first, I think that in developing countries like in Africa, uh, social justice is not simply redistributive. Social justice is also about generating 
wealth and through entrepreneurship and public and private sector to make the pie much bigger. So it's important when we are talking, the second, it's, so it, it, it's important that um, the, 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 the concept of uh, social justice in Africa is generative, as, uh, as you have said, not just simply redistributive. And, but, but to accomplish this, increasing productivity is important and developing cutting edge knowledge is also essential to increase productivity. And the way this will work, as I said earlier, is to get the few who are highly educated to not only produce research by themselves on, 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 on their own, but offering opportunities for others, many, 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 many others to do the same. That's where the concept of academic um, entrepreneurship come from. But then it's critical as well that this research in, is translated to subsistence farmers, to um, private sector entrepreneurs, small, medium, and large, so that it can be, you know, it can increase, um, you know, uh, production in various sectors, and the institutions that, particularly the traditional Afri institution in Africa, will take care of the rest, you know, because you know, we have, you know, Africa has already this kind of redistributive culture within the family, within the community, you know. And that's what helped, for instance, education to spread very quickly. Because I mean, like any of us know that when you, when you, when one succeeds, it's clear an example for everybody around around you. And you know, you pay tuition fee for everyone in your family, and, you know, so on. So, my it's really important that we understand that social entrepreneurship, academic entrepreneurship, and effort to connect the research with entrepreneurship are crit critical, not only for development, but also for social justice on the continent. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we have other questions. I will ask uh, uh, the Dean of the Global School uh, to uh, Professor Mimi Scheller to ask her question directly, and then we'll go back to the q and the other q and Thank you, Professor Samase. Thank you so much, Professor Wanchukan, for that really fascinating presentation and ideas which are, are new to me. Uh, to be honest, I haven't heard it framed in quite this way, and the kinds of partnerships you're calling for are very um, important. I want to ask, though, a, a sort of a challenge from a kind of critical economics perspective. And I'm just curious to see what your what your response to this would be, because some would say that um, this sounds when when you talk about the um, building human capital at the at the top, right, the high achievers, um, and and partnering them with the entrepreneurs, it could sound like what we used to call trickle down economics. And there is a critique of Western uh, entrepreneurship that it's built incredible wealth at the top and that it hasn't actually reached the rest of society. And that in fact, we've created a larger and larger divide between the 1% and the, the, the rest. So what, I'm interested how you just talked about Africa having a redistributive culture. Could you elaborate on the way in which your vision might actually also be suggesting a new kind of redistributive entrepreneurship? I mean, by building this kind of human capital, how will it reach all of um, African societies and people that are not in that top echelon. So, so thank you very much. So, um, you know, this is a great, this is a, this is a fantastic question. So, um, first of all, um, okay, already many traditional Afri African communities 
or most African communities, at least relatively, are less hierarchical than many Western uh, communities. And in my own research, for instance, I see that in the 19th century, when you, you, a school is created in a village, let's say a village of 300 people, and three persons from that village went to school. The next generation, the children of those who did not go to school and the children of those who did go to school, the, edu the school enrollment rate is almost the same. Inequality is reduced drastically from one generation to another. Now, when we look at the third generation, in fact, those whose grandfathers did not go to school, they tend to do even better than those whose grandfathers have been to school. What is the mechanism? is the fact that there are a lot of what I call educational externalities in African communities because of the tense social networks. But something else happened is that when an education opportunity exists and some development opportunity are created, it expands very, very quickly to others, you know? So, and very, I have a lot of evidence to back it up. So now, so this culture exists, but, but now you can, you can waste it or you can actually develop it and expand it. That's why for us to make sure that we don't turn into highly, highly unequal societies like, you know, European countries and in the US currently, that development is taking into consideration our local culture, our local traditional institutions, that's one, but also that it's highly, highly focused on provision of public goods so that, as I said, earlier, the development of human capital is correlated with reduction in inequality, not an increase in inequality. You see what I mean? So the evidence show that this is possible, that the expansion of the educational opportunities can actually reduce inequality. But in the past, it happened more or less naturally. But currently, for this, for this to happen, you don't know to rely only on culture or traditions. You need to set up institutions at local level, local government, national governments, with a focus on, you know, like investing in public goods, health, education, um, but at the same time, um, uh, you, you, you know, uh, make sure that uh, you know, hiring practices, for instance, are very balanced and fair. You know? So I agree with you entirely that for uh, you know, entrepreneurship and particularly human capital, uh, sorry, uh, entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneur human capital to lead to development, you need to set up institutions that maintain some degree of you know, equality and access among individuals. And what I'm going to say, what I said earlier, is that there is something more natural in Africa along those lines, but to make sure that this culture is maintained and developed, political institution, government structure, government policies are really important, you know, um, so that we don't turn into highly, highly unequal societies like Europe and US. Thank you so much. Let me uh, add another question here. I'm sure this is a very difficult question and we might be able to come back to it along. So let's let's look at the Q&A. There's a, a question here, very inspiring vision. Thank you for a great talk. 
Could you speak a little more about how to engage graduate students in this effort to foster academic entrepreneurship? Graduate students play such a critical role in bringing research ideas to fruition. I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on attracting grad students to these efforts. So, yeah, uh, no, thank you very much. That's a great question. So <clears throat> in this talk, I consider faculty and graduate students as colleagues. You know, I'm not trying to distinguish between senior faculty, junior faculty, and graduate students, or even to some degree undergraduate students. You know, so um, the, when I'm calling for collaboration, it can be at the institutional level, you know, WPI working, for instance, with, I don't know, maybe African School of Economics or the Panatric Science Research Council. It could be at the faculty level, you know, you know, where, for instance, a lab uh, in one institution, for instance, collaborates on the lab, so on. But then it can, it, it should be indeed also at the graduate student level, you know. And how does it happen? You know, maybe uh, opportunity for graduate students to travel, to work with other faculty and graduate students in Africa, and to African graduate students, for instance, to, to, to visit the US. For instance, to give you one example, um, there are, you know, graduate students, for instance, based in Brazil, working, who are well published, who are, you know, very much at the frontier. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I say Brazil because I, I know it, that particular example. Why? Well, because every single year, that student visits Harvard or, or Berkeley, you know, to work with faculty, other students there. So he's taking full advantage of being in Brazil, but also being the US, you know? And if you can see, you see his work, it reflect the fact that he's well traveled and he has opportunity for mobility, you know? So to summarize, we are all part of the same research community, whether institutions, faculty, junior, senior, and graduate student. So the way this work is by providing, uh, by, by helping mobility, you know, uh, between mobility of graduate students uh, to go to Africa and for African to be able to come here a and to maybe mobilize this, this talent around specific project, you know, that should be conducted, um, you know. So, so yes, that's how I see the involvement of uh, graduate students. Thank you so much. This is another question from Professor Justo here. What models of social entrepreneurship and development do you find best suited for African culture and society, especially those related to the kind of inclusive well-being that you've pointed to being critical to African society? <laughs> that, 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 that's a great question. So um, the one that's best suited is the one that have some element of social entrepreneurship, you know, like if you build, let's say, a, um, you know, basically a very, a, uh, you, if, if you build a company, like uh, in rural Africa, for instance, a, a major part of it should involve providing public goods, contributing to the provision of public goods, uh, creating space for the community to interact. And, you know, so, you know, and, 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 and I'm not talking about redistributing profits or, you know, cash handouts, but, try to not destroy, but maintain the social fabric that exists, you know? So, 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 so I think that the entrepreneurship that is, we need should have always a minimum level of social, social content, you know, activities, investment that help reduce inequality in the community, you know? So, so that's, that, that, that's what I'm saying. I mean, for instance, one of my inspiration has been um, 
the Institute of Research in, uh, in uh, Palm Oil in Pobe, which is uh, uh, in central Benin. It was, I realized later on that that was one of, one of the top uh, research institution uh, in the whole, on the whole continent, maybe around the world in that specific area. But I lived there for a year, but it's like we have schools, we have football stadium everywhere, we have you know, housing for, you cannot distinguish very, you cannot distinguish between the housing for the gardener and the housing for the upper level, um, you know, and they're all part of the same you know, community. Like for instance, when I was living, I was right living across the street from maybe the number two in the Institute who has a PhD in, 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 in bioengineering. So this is the kind, this is the type of entrepreneurship that's, that's needed, you know, in Africa more than anywhere. And I think um, it, it's important, for instance, like the story I just told you about that institute, which is you know, um, a, a, way, a perfect way to combine, you know, uh, research with, um, with um, agricultural production and experimental um, farming, it, it, it's a story that needs to be written, shared widely for people to understand that the model of entrepreneurship, the model of, of um, you know, development that we need may have existed in Africa. You know, and this is one example, you know, instead of trying to import from wherever, learning this and see why it was successful or what were the limitation is something that need it's some kind of research that can be done. So that's why one of my passion besides this kind of work is actually um, economic history. Thank you so much. I, I know there's still a lot of questions, but I know we know Professor Wanchekon will be versed, will be versed uh, throughout the, the session. So maybe we'll, I'll suggest that we move on to the next um, uh, session of lightning talk and then at 10 30 we can come back with more open questions if that is that's okay thank you so much professor Washington, for your your inspiring talk and for these and to the participant for these uh, very crucial questions that we need to continue to think about i would like to now introduce professor uh, robert kruger who will be uh, moderating the lightning talk on uh, various topic related to uh, doing transdisciplinary work in South and Africa. If you have me welcome, Professor Gruber. Uh, thank you, uh, Betong, and thank you, uh, Professor Wanchikan, for your, your talk. Um, and I appreciate all the comments that I saw in the, uh, the Q&A as well. I think that um, what, we've, what we've started here is a conversation that really uh, is beginning to tease out the the distinction or the tension actually between uh, redistributive justice and generative justice. Uh, under the model of redistributive justice, it's uh, hoped that um, the value that's created will be shared amongst the many where generative justice has more of a focus on um, and other economic relationships can support this, that people share in the value that they create themselves. Um, and we don't have to worry about a government or something else uh, um, redistributing that, um, you know, and it, and it goes to this idea of an extractive industry as, you know, um, uh, as, as development being an extractive industry where um, we count on other people to redistribute the wealth that we provide uh, or that we can generate rather than uh, helping people develop self-sufficiency, self-determination, and therefore sustainability. So I wanna uh, introduce uh, each of the members or uh, our lightning talk panelists. Um, I'll start with uh, Professor Zarina Patel. Zarina is a friend of mine who serves with me on the board of local environment. Uh, she is uh, in the Department of Geographical Science at the University of Cape Town. Her work focuses on transdiscipl transdisciplinary approaches to navigating alternative insights on complex urban issues in the global South. 
And this idea of transdisciplinary is critical because it brings into the idea, it brings into the uh, equation that we do have other forms of knowledge that we need to uh, uh, bring in uh, and take seriously as we negotiate these uh, politics. Serena, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you, Rob, <laughs> for that introduction. Um, there we go. Uh, um, good afternoon, everyone. It's afternoon for me, late afternoon here in Cape Town in South Africa. Um, and I'd really like to thank Rob for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to share a, a, a different story about African academic entrepreneurship um, from some of the experiences that I've been involved in. So as Rob says, I'm a geographer at the University of Cape Town, and my research is focused on the role of urban knowledge creation to foster sustainable and just urban transitions in African cities. What I'm going to share with you today is a brief overview, a brief flavor of a five-year program that engaged African early career scholars in transdisciplinary practices in African cities. I'll be reflecting on a learning study that I led that aimed to engage with the role of the role and distinctiveness of transdisciplinarity in urban change in African contexts. Next slide, please. So the program was called LIRA, Leading Integrated Research for Agenda 2030 in Africa. And this program was led by the International Science Council in Paris in partnership with the Network of African Science Academies or NASIC, uh, funded by CEDAS, the Swedish aid agency. The program included 38 cities, 22 countries, and 28 projects. Um, and the distinctive features of this uh, transdisciplinary program was that it promotes transdisciplinary research and partnership building uh, um, uh, in, in different cities. It fosters collaboration between two cities. So each project constitutes two cities in two different countries uh, in Africa. And it links projects with global scientific agendas. So there were three cohorts um, starting in, in, in different years and each cohort focused on a different global agenda, energy, health, natural disaster nexus, uh, advancing the implementation of SDG 11 in cities and pathways towards sustainable urban development. And a key issue here is that with these projects is that it increases funding and institutional support within Africa. Next slide, please. The learning study goals were to demonstrate the diversity of understanding and practices of transdisciplinarity across the LIRA projects, uh, to understand how acquired learning happens during the duration of a project and how changes in action happen over two years, to identify key enablers and challenges for TD, and to look at, to identify and categorize the range of results emerging from the program. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. In terms of the geographical spread, we have a mixture of cities is from sub-Saharan Africa, a mixture in size, demographic, socioeconomic, political context, et cetera. And it clearly demonstrates that Africa is not a country, but a continent made up of a, a very diverse set of contexts. And I think a key issue here is that the, there's a knowledge connectivity that is happening across the continent that has never happened before through these collaborative uh, uh, two city projects. Next slide, please. So if we look firstly at the practices of, no, sorry, one behind, thank you. Uh, uh, practices of transdisciplinarity, which really is about looking at the, uh, the diversity of understanding of pra uh, and practices of TD across the projects. Firstly, what we found is that projects adapted definitions and approaches from the global north with an emphasis on collaboration, societal relevance, knowledge integration, reflexivity and flexibility. In terms of project setup, partnerships were built mostly based on established networks, and PIs emphasized the significance of literature and policy reviews and, and other desktop work, but also ground truthing um, with diverse knowledge partners. In terms of knowledge creation, teams were multidisciplinary with a, reach, with a requirement um, to include scientific and um, social science partners, as well as policy and community actors. In terms of TD design features, there were a range of different formats that were used across the different projects, uh, including workshops, field visits, focus groups, learning labs, exhibitions, photographic competitions, um, et cetera. 
But there was also really important work to address power relations within these multidisciplinary teams. Uh, what we called it, an equality of voice was a really important aspect of the program. If we can look at the next slide, please. In terms of acquired learnings and actions, um, what we found is that projects were emergent and iterative, and, and there were large deviations from the initial um, uh, proposals. As projects um, uh, evolved over time, there were lots of moments of learning that allowed for uh, um, issues to change and for, for projects to, to, to change their processes. And one of the key learnings here was that the research design cannot be cut and pasted from one city to the next. There are very different contexts in different cities, in different African cities that need to be responded to. Next slide, please. In terms of enablers and challenges, here I think the key issue is that transdisciplinary research is premised on the assumption that multiple knowledges will result in more relevant research and practice out outputs. However, pathways between new knowledge um, and societal problem solving are not solely dependent on knowledge. Strategies to foster structural ch changes within and between institutions have also been shown to be as significant as new knowledge insights and fostering change. New knowledge, technologies, policy positions can only be taken up if the institutional settings and cultures are, um, are, are able to respond to these alternatives. The next slide, please. In terms of the range of results, there were a number of different uh, uh, products that were pre produced from, uh, from this program, uh, public, uh, academic publications by African authors, uh, policy briefs, exhibitions, et cetera. Um, and so there, there's a real shift about seeing the African city and Africans seeing the city. So this question of legibility and credibility were absolutely critical in terms of uh, the range of results. Next slide, please. In terms of the value of TD in African cities, I think one of the key things I want to highlight from this slide, I won't go through all of it, but one of the key things I want to highlight is the credibility, uh, raising the credibility of early career researchers. Um, because it, this program really demonstrated the innovation and leadership of a new generation of thought leaders. And this is a really critical cultural shift in African contexts, uh, where the funding political economy really favors more established researchers. And then last slide, please. In terms of conclusions, um, I can say that engaging with the what and the how of urban change across diverse African contexts is particularly significant in post-colonial cities in order to foster just transitions. Projects provide evidence of what it means to do urban science, um, creating an urban disposition, a way of seeing, a way of doing, and a way of being. Over the three cohorts, the approaches to TD progressively approached more than a method and was understood in addition as both a political and a social practice. The focus on tacit factors such as open hearts, minds and wills to shape engagements points to a markedly different set of skills and competencies required by researchers to engage in TD. And finally, the Lira researchers have contributed significantly to shifting the political economy of knowledge production on and of Africa. They, the African researchers are telling their own story from their own context. So um, research by Africans in African cities for inclusive African cities. So thank you. And I'm sorry, I took a little bit of extra time. <laughs> sorry about that. Okay, Serena, I, I'm, you've reminded me how pleased I am that uh, you were able to join us today. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Hopefully we'll have some a chance uh, in a little bit to have more of a discussion. I'd, not, I'd like to now uh, introduce uh, Professor Patricio Longa, uh, who is a sociologist and a professor in higher education studies at Eduardo Mondon University in Maputo, Mozambique. Um, his uh, research focuses on really how do we integrate um, so-called Western knowledge uh, uh, in African universities in the African educational experience uh, and um, so that we can work together to create new innovative capacity. So uh, I'll also say, uh, Professor Longa, uh, we negotiated with three different time zones for him to be here today because he was teaching in Germany, living in Mozambique, and of course, we're on Eastern Daylight Time. So without further ado, Professor Manga, would you please uh, continue? Thank you so much, uh, Rob. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, everyone. Uh, 
Um, I'm really pleased to be part of this uh, conversation. Uh, as uh, Rob just mentioned, uh, just uh, uh, ended a, a class right now on uh, uh, decolonizing uh, knowledge and science uh, from the global south. And I just missed the last, uh, uh, I just got the last bit of my pre the previous presenter, which I, uh, I believe is from South Africa. Uh, so I'm going to really briefly quick uh, share some thoughts on uh, one, just one aspect of the complex, uh, you know, relationships between the global North and, and Africa in particular, uh, uh, and, and especially uh, one particular feature of inter-university partnerships. Uh, and, and this is also quite broad, you know, it can imply um, many, uh, uh, there's many dimensions uh, of that uh, uh, relationship. But my focus will be on what can be done um, giving the historical legacies of structured um, and still some ongoing uh, processes of you know inequalities. How can we uh, start uh, over, you know, um, and try to move towards new grounds where uh, we don't we no longer have the need to call for decolonization of this of that. Uh, we can live in a space and time where uh, decolonization or any calls for such uh, kinds of you know, um, justice or generative justices are a thing of the past. So please next, uh, I don't know who is managing the, okay. So this is briefly um, uh, what I, I'm going to discuss, two mainly points, um, just a little bit of who I am, and then two key points. One, just to make the case, and uh, finally some tips and examples on how we can um, uh, work together. Um, yes, next. <clears throat> so uh, I think uh, Rob already uh, generously introduced me. I, I teach, I'm a sociologist by training, um, I trained in Mozambique, in South Africa, in Norway, and in life also. Uh, my work in the last couple of years focused mostly on comparative higher education, uh, science, innovation, uh, and policies, uh, mainly uh, in sub Saharan Africa. Uh, but uh, since I'm also uh, interested in knowledge itself as you know, the theory of knowledge and epistemologies, I also happen to work in many other parts. As uh, um, uh, now um, I said, I was teaching in Germany and uh, I'm also engaged in a number of projects, uh, including one particular project with uh, Rob uh, with the WPI. <clears throat> um, and and uh, uh, I will talk very briefly about this uh, project, but I will then invite all of you to visit a site, uh, a link which I've uh, uh, shared, which gives you a glimpse of what we tried to do uh, in a very, uh, you know, I think uh, out of the box and groundbreaking way. Uh, next, please. Um, yeah, so I think, um, and I mentioned this, that we kind of uh, um, inherited a, a, a world in which uh, not only the structures, the social structures, but also um, uh, financial structures uh, are set um, on an equal uh, path and on an equal way. Uh, there's plenty of literature that shows that, that shows the colonial mindset under which uh, not only the cognitive structures, but also um, the you know um, operational mechanisms uh, like uh, funding systems are very much um, um, shaped uh, you know and defined by inequalities. Uh, there's been quite a number of uh, uh, you know effort to change that, um, uh, including programs like uh, capacity building. Um, which uh, now uh, can also be part of the problem more than the solution. And we'll try to see how that uh, works. But basically what I'm saying here is that we're coming from a, a past and mostly um, a, 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 a past, uh, but a present which still uh, bears some of the, some features of those structuring structures of inequality in the partnerships. Uh, next. 
<clears throat> so uh, part of the mindset is framed around notions that it might be quite familiar to most of us and what I call Northern centrism. So ideas are shaped, are framed, are conceived in the North and then they are exported globally. Uh, white centrism, no, and usually uh, uh, in these uh, spaces, um, uh, uh, um, mostly dominated as again in the literature is quite abundant, this notion of white male male centrism and Eurocentrism. Now, that kind of mindset, although there's been all calls for decolonizing, which set on undoing or redressing some of the legacies of this, uh, there still are some reminiscences of that. And we'll try to see how they uh, impact on uh, the things that we're still doing today. Uh, the next. Yes, uh, for instance, the financial um, uh, dependency is just one example of those uh, systemic structures of inequality. If you look at the main or key uh, uh, funding schemes, they all emanate from the Nordic, from the North. Uh, they are not North, North, North centric. Um, uh, there is this notion that, uh, uh, you know, um, displaying and deploying funds to the global South uh, comes under the banner of aid, and there's all lots of a lot of political economy of aid here, uh, and not necessarily a mutual investment uh, uh, mentality. That you know, by putting resources there, uh, which I'm not going to go through that historically, some of those resources also emerged and came from those places. By putting back those resources, you are um, aiding, you are helping, rather than you know creating a, a partnership. Uh, of mutual uh, investment. Uh, so um, often, as we know, the funding in the South is inadequate uh, for reasons that are also historical and very much associated with the reason why the North is where it is today. Um, and, and of course, especially when you manage to get into some projects, it's, it's you know, the, the, the partners from the South, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, managing the, the sources, the funding that is allocated, they're highly suspect, suspect, suspicious, you know, they're highly. So the whole, um, uh, you know, um, uh, they developed a, a really a rocket science on accountability, on how to make sure that they spend each penny, each dollar uh, because of their lack of integrity into the things that the projects are, are aimed to do. So it's often actually uh, also done um, uh, that the, the PIs of these projects will be someone from the North. You hardly, even though you might see some, you know, uh, changes here and there, but mostly uh, the PIs, uh, even if the work is done mostly by the colleagues from the South, you'll see PIs because the systems, the funding systems are structured in a way that there is, you know, you can't even send the application because it requires that the PI must be from the North. Next. Now, this whole idea of capacity building, for me, it's, um, I'm personally sick and tired of it. I think it's, it's, it carries on this white savior syndrome or mentality that, uh, you know, uh, we are helping this aid mentality more than the, the uh, you know, um, uh, uh, creating opportunities for equal and mutual partnership. But of course, it leaves out of this notion of decolonization that we are doing something, we are extending our end. So it's it's a discourse, it's a decolonization discourse without actually decolonizing. So without actually changing the structures of inequality that are ingrained in these very same programs. And many uh, uh, scholars who have been trained, uh, you know, in, in capacity building development schemes, uh, become frustrated that they, they've joined also many scholars who went abroad, you know, uh, they started in, 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 in the North. When they come back, uh, they, are, they are forced to work in those schemes, uh, capacity building schemes that are uh, structurally unequal. One or other, perhaps those mostly in the diaspora may escape from these, uh, but those also find themselves benefiting from this you know, unbalanced uh, scheme that is already operating. And they uh, come to Africa. Uh, just today, I was reading a call um, by the International Institute of Education, uh, I think for African diaspora scholars, in which they call out for 
um, uh, African based African diasporas in America and Canada to come to Africa and work with African institutions. But they will never consider, they never consider that this should be an equal uh, exchange that colleagues from Africa who might have actually developed in work that is um, of a much higher impact, uh, not only for Africa, but globally, uh, they will never consider them as visiting fellows like uh, I'm doing now with Europe. Uh, next. Yes, so some tips, some ideas on how to, um, you know, overcome these, uh, some of these challenges briefly. I think it's important to establish that whatever kind of partnership that we engage in, it's a co-creation of knowledge. It's a co-creation of research and innovation. Uh, and it's about teams of equals. Um, so we need to encourage Global South leadership in those projects. Uh, in uh, the, 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 the colleagues from the South should also lead in those uh, projects as PIs. Um, uh, uh, reassure that the South uh, to be the first authors in the case of joint publications, recognize value, you know, of available uh, local contributions in, in, you know, studies about the global South uh, affairs and so on and so forth. So I, will, I won't go through all these, uh, uh, but what I'm pushing for here is that uh, there should be a balance. Uh, I'm not also very fond of uh, those so-called afford centrism. I, I don't think we should move for from a Eurocentrism or Northern centrism to a Southern centrism. We should find a balance, you know, depending on particular projects, how things um, uh, should go. Um, next, um, in this, uh, I'm not going to click this one now, but I leave it uh, uh, because of time constraints. But this is a, a, an example of a project that Rob and I and other colleagues uh, put together in which uh, we are trying to establish a eco campus uh, in Mozambique in a very nice uh, location. And this project was developed uh, in its uh, concept, in its initial uh, stage uh, by uh, students uh, at uh, um, WPI students in architectural um, uh, 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 engineering. And together with the community in Makaneta, this is a rural community, uh, and uh, staff from the university, quite a, a diverse group of, of people, inc including uh, 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 community leaders and so on and so on. We came together during two years uh, through actually using uh, online uh, you know, we webinars and, and uh, uh, workshops. We worked through our ideas and we came up with something that um, it's, I think, remarkable. So I would invite everyone to uh, you know, visit uh, this uh, uh, just an idea, and I think it can be replicated elsewhere. This was a partnership of equals, uh, and uh, resources were mobilized from both sides, and this is what we managed to to produce. Next, I think what I, I'm left is is to thank you for your time and your attention. Thank you. Patricio, thank you very much uh, for threading that needle um, and uh, getting here uh, in a, in a, just almost right on time. We are running a little behind and I do apologize for that. So um, uh, trying to work in the background here to maybe rearrange or do some uh, creative uh, thinking around uh, getting everybody through because everybody's threading a needle this morning, it seems. So I'd like to uh, next introduce uh, uh, the Associate Dean of Engineering at Academic City University College in Accra, Ghana. It's one of the premier tertiary universities uh, in Ghana. Uh, and you see and uh, president uh, of, of the university, Fred McBangalori, and I have been working together almost like uh, Siamese twins for a few years now. And uh, it's a partnership that uh, we treasure uh, and, um, and as Teresa just said, it's a partnership of equals where we all go back and forth and, um, and really try to, to take on and value uh, each other's uh, perspectives and work through that. Um, so I wanna turn it over now to Lucy uh, and thank her again for joining us. 
Rob, thank you so much. And I'm so excited that I could be a part of this. There's so much valuable information that is going around. And I think there's so much that we can all take from it. Um, so I know this is supposed to be a lightning round and we are behind time. So I will do this quick. Um, so as um, Rob, has, Rob has already said, we've been doing some fantastic work um, with WPI, and I wanted to take this opportunity to um, show everybody how doing transdisciplinary work in Sub-Saharan um, Africa, um, what we've been doing with WPI, and what are some of the pitfalls and the challenges, and what are some of the success stories that we've had. So next slide, please. So I'll touch on, first of all, give you a little bit about Academic City. I think Rob has done a fantastic job and taking, it said my first line for me about the fact that we are a premium institution. Uh, we'll just touch on some of the joint projects that we've done and then um, lessons, challenges and lessons learned. Next slide, please. So Academic City University College uh, is a premium tertiary education offering holistic education to create well-rounded minds. Um, the main idea behind our institution or what we are trying to do differently is to have a type of education on our part of the world that is more reflective of emerging trends in industry. We want to be that particular institution that is ahead of the game, that is coming up with new generation of thinkers, innovators, who are not just focused about getting degrees, but rather want to combine human-centered cross-cultural design principles with social sciences to come up with and um, to co-define problems and co-design solutions um, with the local community. When you look at the type of students Academic City have, we aim them to be holistic. Um, we want them not just to be book smart, we want them to be street smart as well. We have an underlying core of entrepreneurial thinking in everything that we do. And I think one of our pride and joy in what we do and where WPI has, has been an amazing partner and in some of our innovatively designed curriculum, I mean, we are, one of, we are the first university on our part of the world in West Africa to be offering robotics engineering as an undergraduate degree, offering artificial intelligence as an undergraduate degree. And we couldn't have done this without WPI's help, without their help. And how we deploy our, our innovative curriculum, we're strong advocates that when you're teaching, we can't teach the way we teach traditionally all over the world. It can't be a class where people are sitting, listening to somebody talk on end. It needs to be experiential. It has to be practical. It needs to be contextual. It needs to make sense for the continent that the university is based in for our region. People need to be able to understand the relevance of the courses being taken and impact it has on the immediate society. We think our learning should be unified, how industry works, where you don't have one person or one skill set working. So we have to teach in a collaborative, multidisciplinary manner. And lastly, what we call extensional learning, which means if the students an attitude of um, learning, continuous learning for improvement. So just next slide, please. Just to quickly touch on some of the collaborations that we've had with WPI. Um, we had our first international conference on development engineering. And this sat very closely to uh, what we wanted to do and what WPI had been doing. As you all know, development engineering is an emerging field of, it's not, it's not longer emerging, but rather a field of academic inquiry that are looking to collaborate with local communities and industries to co-design, define, and co-produce problems and solutions. And when we, we saw the amazing work WPI was doing and where our vision line, we came together to organize um, the first international conference on development engineering. It was a two-day conference um, bringing together experts and students to discuss ways of pushing the development engineering agenda beyond its current limits. And by uh, we, we use that opportunity to draw on new design thinking, cross-cultural, project-based learning, to share ideas and see how do we move this agenda forward. Interestingly enough, this conference was in, in February. No one or none of us knew that in March, COVID was gonna come and things were gonna go awry. So currently, one of the things that we have planned that there's gonna be a follow-up uh, conference as of this, and we haven't had the opportunity to do that yet, but we hope to do so. Next slide, please. 
I quickly want to talk a little bit about some of the projects that we've been involved with um, with WPI. Um, so one of these projects is what we call the Agogloshi E-Waste Challenge. It was actually a design competition involving WPI students who joined us remotely and Academic City University students working with the Agogloshi E-Waste processes to come up with ideas of improving the way E-Waste processes do their work you'll find out that the Agroblochi market has one of the biggest e-waste in the whole of West Africa, if not Africa as a whole. So this was an excellent um, demonstration of the partnership we have with WPI. And even though we couldn't be together in person, um, we had um, the WPI team joining us online, meeting with our students virtually, coming up with design solutions together and presenting together. Another project that we can boast of that we think was an other, another fascinating one was one that was being done in Achim um, Genasi. And actually this project was more WPI led and they invited our students to come along um, to the Eastern region to work with the people of Genasi to build some bridges. Others were working with teachers of schools to develop teaching aids. And that, to be honest, our students were, you know, amazed and they thoroughly enjoyed it. And this led nicely to some of the activities that now we take, where we are constantly actively going to the local communities to see how can we build value and how can we bring more technology to them. There are other projects that we've done as well. The Jessa project, um, which was... Um, coming up with emergency services in West Africa, and so many other things that we've done on the project front. Um, I thought I'll take this opportunity to highlight two of um, my personal favorite ones. Um, so I'll move on quickly to other collaborations we've done with WPI on the joint, um, next slide please. Yes, other ways we've collaborated with WPI. So after our development engineering uh, um, conference and COVID hit, um, all schools all over the world, everybody had to literally move online. And Academic City were one of those institutions in Ghana, within a week, we're able to move all our lectures online. But it also gave us a very, very interesting opportunity. We wanted to explore um, the relationship with WPI a bit further to see are there some courses that we could join, our students could join to benefit from and then join us vice versa. So one of the courses that was quite successful in doing this was SD150, which was Introduction to System Dynamics Modeling, which we joined both in 2020 and 2021. So the images that you have there, and I have to say a massive, massive thank you Professor Mike uh, for accommodating us both in 2020 and for accommodating us in 2021. It gave our students an opportunity to be part of the wider global team and to see how lectures are done elsewhere and to also pick up some lessons from that as well. Next slide, please. Now, just to end off with the challenges and lessons learned. The joint conference, as I said, was extremely successful. We had both international and local coordination. I think at one point, um, we literally were on the phone all the time with rock back and forth, and it was amazing. There was so much that was done, so much that was le um, um, learned, and so many opportunities for their future. Nevertheless, as I said, because COVID happened, the next development engineering conference is yet to be scheduled. But I believe that we will be scheduling another one soon. And the decision will be whether it's been done in WPI and we will come over or we'll do it a virtual now that the world is going on a hybrid um, and tangent. Um, in terms of the joint projects, what we realize at Academic City to do transdisciplinary work, it's easier to coordinate on a project level, because with a project, there's kind of like a defined agenda, what we are trying to do and what the expected outcome is. And both parties, both WPI and Academic City are both able to benefit from this. Um, we're able to be more equal partners, if I, if I can put it that way, where we all leverage on each other's location and network to obtain critical information and to be able to support projects. And you see this being particularly useful in the COVID era where the WPI students were not able to come to Ghana and the Academic City students therefore were able to um, assist in that particular era and still come up with successful projects. Um, the joint lectures, um, I guess some of the lessons learned or the challenges that we experienced is that it was easier for our students to join WPI lectures 
when WPI's lectures itself was remote or was virtual. So I think in 2020, which was the first time that we tried, um, at that time, most of the courses were online. And as I said, Professor Mike was very gracious and said, yes, our students could join. And our students were fascinated, you know, and um, thoroughly enjoyed the, that exam. Um, come 2021, we're now going towards more hybrid events. Most classes are returning back to normal. And one of the challenges that we saw um, with our engineering students when we are virtual is the same thing that we saw with WPEI as well, whereby because with the nature of engineering lends itself to more practical and more hands-on work, it is quite difficult to do a virtual program which meant that some of the identified courses that we had seen that WPI were offering um, were in person, which means we could therefore not um, join virtually because all the students were gonna be present physically in WPI. We also had a bit of scheduling issues. Um, WPI runs a term um, type configuration. In 2020, we did run a term type configuration, but we are back to semester wise configuration, which made it a bit challenging. And to me, and this is a personal opinion, I felt that when it came to doing the joint lectures, it was skewed to benefit just one party, which is as Academic City. We have the pleasure of joining um, WPI lectures, and I'm yet to see um, the benefit from um, to WPI because we believe that we also have some very unique courses that are tailored to our part of the world that um, students from WPI who are interested in Africa, where Africa is going, technologies that Africa should be implementing will probably benefit if they could join as well. So courses around fundamentals in innovation and entrepreneurship, doing business in Africa, technology and its impact on the African society. Those are all courses that I believe WPEI has not had the pleasure to benefit from us yet. But I'm hoping that as our relationship builds, as we draw even closer together and as we do more interesting projects, that opportunity will come. But if you were to ask me what is the way forward right now, I think it's more easier for us to coordinate on the joint project and then find a way to share ideas on some of the courses we teach. And with that note, I would like to say thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Rob. Really have enjoyed working with you for the past two years, and I hope there's more years of us working together. And thank you for everybody who's listened to me today. Thank you so much, uh, Lucy. That was uh, very nice and um, very generous. Thank you. Uh, I'll say that... Um, the, the teams that worked together last year during the pandemic uh, really learned what it meant to uh, co-produce knowledge together that nobody had the right insight. It took everybody together to tr try to um, come up with some plausible solutions. I'd now like to introduce our very own uh, Professor Hermine Vidog Baton. Uh, she is a uh, postdoc and part-time faculty member in the Department of Social Sciences and Policy Studies. She is leading uh, our research on um, the experience of black students at WPI, um, which is very inward looking and critical study of ourselves. Um, and, but she also has a very impressive research portfolio uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, which she will now talk to you about. Thank you, Hermine. Hi, Rob. It's possible that Hermine had to step out for a class because we're running late. Okay. Um, well, let's. We, we also lost Carrie, uh, the last speaker, because uh, we're running late. So um, she says she's still here. Um, why don't we just sort of. Um... Oh, here she is. Here she is. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, loud and clear, thank you. Okay, sorry, my computer was frozen. Okay. Thank you all for introducing me here. And uh, 
I'm going to talk about uh, my work uh, on uh, pollution and health in sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, I'm going to specifically talk about uh, uh, air pollution and children uh, health in Benin and uh, an ongoing research on e-waste uh, pollution and women health uh, in uh, Accra. Uh, next, please. So uh, research shows that uh, uh, human activities and natural events are the major sources of uh, pollution. And air pollution is uh, silently killing millions of people nationwide, especially people in uh, the global south uh, through non-communicable diseases, uh, including cardiovascular diseases, uh, preventable cancers, uh, uh, chronic respiratory diseases and others. And uh, a high percentage of uh, these studies uh, uh, found that uh, for population who are most uh, uh, affected by uh, pollution are the ones uh, who have uh, some sort of, uh, of uh, of vulnerability, and those are women, pregnant, pregnant women, uh, uh, the children, and the elderly. And uh, for example, we, uh, the World Health Organization found that uh, about 4.2 million of premature deaths occur in uh, 2016. And uh, this is caused by air pollution. And among these uh, uh, deaths, we have uh, about 91% that uh, uh, occurred in uh, low and middle income countries. Next, please. So research also shows that uh, there is uh, uh, an association between uh, prolonged exposure to to the different sources of uh, pollution that you see on the images and uh, both for pre-term uh, uh, pre birth and low birth <coughs> weight, weight. However, only a few studies uh, focus uh, on the effect of, uh, on, uh, of the Sahara desert dust uh, on the health of the local population. You might have heard about uh, Sahara desert dust. Uh, about two years ago, we have uh, a dust, uh, uh, a, a Godzilla dust, that they call it, uh, that came from the Sahara Desert uh, all the way to the U.S. Uh, uh, and to the uh, to the uh, 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 Caribbean. So we usually see in the literature many studies about Sahara Desert dust uh, effect on uh, people in the uh, in Europe uh, and uh, the U.S. Uh, but uh, not that many attention uh, on uh, the effect of uh, pollution, air pollution, uh, desert dust pollution on the local uh, 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 population in Africa. Next, please. So in my studies, desert dust and child health outcome, uh, evidence from Benin, I use demographic and health data and also satellite derived uh, dust particulate and weather data. Uh, to investigate uh, the effect of dust uh, on child mortality and birth weight. So the survey collected uh, collect, uh, information on mothers and their children who live uh, in the cluster presented, uh, represented in the map. And, uh, and what I found that, I found that there is an association between uh, mother's exposure to dust uh, during pregnancy and low birth weight but I did not find any association uh, with a child uh, mortality. And uh, I also found that mothers uh, who have uh, uh, a high level of education and wealth, both combined, they can help reduce the effect of this on the children's health. Next, please. So here are some implications that we can all think about. So I found that uh, exposure can be reduced uh, if we use uh, technology and innovation to put in place uh, warning systems uh, to alert uh, uh, and prepare uh, for dust, st dust storms. We see those uh, in uh, US, in uh, Europe, but there's none uh, available in Africa. 
and also promoting education and more importantly, uh, creating income generative uh, opportunities for women will easily help uh, increase of the access to water, food or transportation and also shelter. And that will reduce uh, the prolonged exposure to dust uh, during the storm. Because we found that wealthier women who have uh, water sources close to the household, for instance, do not need to travel long uh, kilo uh, kilometers to access uh, to water. Uh, next, please. So here, I very quickly, I'm going to tell you what we are doing in Accra, uh, uh, Ghana, to help women reduce uh, exposure to, to e-waste pollutant. So Agroboshi uh, uh, was the largest e-waste site uh, uh, in the world, uh, and uh, it housed migrant workers and from Northern Ghana. And uh, while much of the focus by the media and the researchers were on male workers, we found that women who prepare food and sell them on the e-waste site were equally, if not more exposed to e-waste pollution. So uh, an example of a women exposure occur uh, through uh, the breathing uh, toxic air, uh, eating contaminated food and using contaminated water. So what we are doing uh, with students is to be able to use technology and research to uh, design and uh, implement a burn, a burn bus to reduce exposure to e-waste pollutant. Uh, we are also uh, working with women on food processing uh, method uh, uh, to, to reduce contamination through uh, in ingestion. And finally, because we, we know, and from my previous study, we know that it's important to uh, provide uh, uh, women with uh, business opportunity. We are working with uh, the women in Accra to explore additional uh, income generative uh, opportunities, such as uh, uh, making bags, as you can see, making bags out of uh, recycled water, water sachet. Thank you uh, for your attention. Thank you, Hermine. It was a very nice uh, presentation and I'm glad you have a chance to share your work with us once again. Um, okay, so uh, Professor uh, Terry McGoldrick, uh, who is Professor of Theology at uh, the uh, at Providence College in Rhode Island, had to step away to go teach a class. Um, so uh, uh, I have agreed to um, give his presentation, although I will tell you the first time I saw these slides was about eight minutes ago. So I'll do my best. I will do my best to get through very quickly so we can get to the videos and have some time for closure and discussion. Um, if, if you can stay a little longer past 11, that would be uh, great. So, um, what Terry was going to talk about was uh, WPI's uh, new Stephen J. Mecca Center for Sustainable Development, which is uh, uh, embedded within the Institute of Science and Technology for Development. It's named after the gentleman in the picture in the lower right-hand corner, Stephen Mecca, who was an engineer at Providence College who invented technology um, that ultimately became uh, known as the microflush toilet. Next slide, please. Um, Stephen started his work in Ghana, but has uh, uh, he passed away uh, in 2018 and Terry took over uh, the role of um, leading this project. And in 2020, they uh, were part of, invited to be part of a Catholic Relief Services USAID DIPSA um, to uh, bring uh, the microflush technology to Ethiopia, primarily in the Oromia region. Uh, you can see the data there, 28% open uh, defecation, sanitation costs are through the roof, and, uh, but there is uh, some uh, toilet use in, uh, in houses. Next slide, please. So again, uh, just to sort of, uh, the key thing about uh, the toilets are that um, one, uh, they take water from a catchment system 
above that provides uh, hand, a capacity for one person to wash their hands. The gray water that leaves uh, the sink where they've washed their hands goes into the toilet for the next flush. Uh, the uh, remnants in the toilet are then uh, hit a concrete slab where worms uh, uh, eat the solids, the liquids are diverted. And after six or so months, you get a um, uh, compostable, uh, well, you get a compost um, made from human waste. Uh, it won a $100,000 prize from the Gates Foundation um, around 2015 and was offered additional uh, support from the Gates Foundation uh, later. Next slide, please. Okay, this is our current uh, uh, grant. Uh, WPI uh, has received uh, part of a $140 million award, a five-year uh, grant from USAID to uh, not only create, uh, to, to disseminate these toilets, but to train uh, maker agents who uh, are involved not only in um, the construction of the toilet, but the, the, uh, training new toilet um, contractors, helping develop the supply chain. Um, there is a, a focus on women and youth empowerment in this. And WPI, as it says, is the uh, technical lead for this project. Next slide, please. So this is what they look like. These are the first ones that were built. Um, uh, last year, as part of one of those uh, online uh, IQPs with Ghana, there's a number of these toilets in Ghana. We did a study of uh, the um, uh, resilience of these toilets, and we found some working after 14 years. So um, that's a pretty good outcome. Next slide. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, here we are. We're now to the video montage. And as, I'm, as I was thinking about it, Maybe we should have made the faculty do the video montages so we could hold them to five minutes because we never stay within our amount of time. Uh, I'm including myself in that uh, as well. Um, but what we tried to offer you in the previous uh, lightning talks was um, sort of a funnel approach. You know, the first two talks really uh, tried to pick up on some of the big themes about collaboration that Professor Wanchikong uh, raised uh, and how that might look like uh, conceptually. Uh, and then um, as we worked our way through, we see uh, student entrepreneurialism, we see faculty entrepreneurialism uh, in faculty and student-led uh, research projects. Um, and now we wanna highlight three uh, research projects from students at WPI. Uh, the first one we have is from, uh, they're all from the uh, master's program in science and technology for uh, innovation and global development. The first one is around uh, education um, by uh, Kennedy Damoa, a Ghanaian. Uh, and then we have um, a biomedical device uh, creation project that um, is being uh, led by uh, Julie Sabater. And she is not only working with an undergraduate group of biomedical engineering students, she's also doing an analysis of uh, their uh, transdisciplinary work as they're also working with schools, students from the business school, as well as arts and sciences. And finally, Julian Bennett, um, uh, who is a, uh, hopefully going to be a, B be a PhD student very soon, is gonna talk about his work using uh, Sterling engines to create energy from uh, the off gas from those micro flush toilets. So Rachel, will you go ahead and play those videos for us? Thank you. And thanks again to our lightning speakers. Hi, I'm Kennedy Damore, a graduate student in the Science and Technology and Innovation for Global Development Program. I am interested in science, technology, engineering, and math, STEM education research, and how online learning systems can improve teaching and learning of STEM, especially for immigrant and refugee students. I am interested in STEM education research because Students' academic success and future employability larger depends on their performance in science and math. Hi, 
However, racial and ethnic minorities are underrepresented in STEM careers. Most of these minority students initially decide to major in STEM, but drop out along the way. About 29% of Black and 23% of Hispanic STEM students, for example, drop out of college. Some switch to non-STEM majors. This has been attributed to the lack of persistence and preparedness, especially in high school math. But a well-structured program and curriculum can improve students' interest and self-efficacy in STEM majors and careers. So effective interventions to improve STEM education continue to be studied, but little is currently being done to specifically study what works for immigrant and refugee children. Studies, for example, have shown that to ensure student success in STEM majors and careers, interest must be inculcated in children as, as early as middle school. As immigrant and refugee population in the U.S. continue to rise, my research aims to enhance refugee and immigrant children's interest and self-efficacy in STEM to improve their future employability. The African Community Education, ACE, a nonprofit organization in Worcester, provides the ideal population for my research. ACE is an after school program that provides educational, cultural, and social resources for immigrant and refugee families from West, East, and Central Africa. The organization serves over 500 5th to 12th graders each year. And over the past years, have increased their high school graduation and college enrollment rates more than 10% compared to the overall Worcester Public School students. But despite these successes, A students continue to struggle in math and science. My research aims to use soccer, which is the students' preferred sports to enhance their interest and improve their performance in math and science. We design soccer-based projects to help students learn math and science. And some of these projects can either be hands-on or stories. And they are aimed to enhance the students' interest by first and foremost, demystifying STEM as an elitist program instead of something that is part of our lives. One of these projects, a group of elementary school students read a short story about Pele, the Brazilian soccer superstar. At the end of the story, which all the students read in turn, they were asked to sketch and label the length and width of a soccer field. In the same story, the overall goal of Pele, the overall goals of Pele were compared to another Brazilian soccer player and the students were asked to calculate the goal difference. These not native English speaking kids learn an essential skill for a successful STEM education in the US, which is an effective communication. As they read the story and summarize it in a sentence, they learn that the soccer field is a plain figure. It has a length and a width. In this, these students can subsequently learn how to calculate, for example, the area of a soccer field. Most interestingly, at the end of the lesson, one student came back and asked, isn't this supposed to be a STEM class? Why did we read a story? This question revealed the student's profound misunderstanding about STEM and how a new and targeted pedagogical approach that is culturally and experientially relevant can change this perception and subsequently enhance their interest and improve their understanding. In my current study, I am working on how students can learn the various aspects of geometry from its basic form, such as shape, shapes and space, to the advanced, such as angles, power lines, transformation, plane figures, and many others using soccer. This study aims to increase A students' interest in math using their preferred sports and increase their spatial thinking skills through object manipulation. Students learn best when they do what they like and, and improve spatial thinking subsequently 
improve students' performance in math. Finding from my research at ACE would ultimately be scaled up, obviously, through modification to assist all immigrant and refugee children across the country and beyond. For Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, a region with a long and rich history of scientific and technological development, my research will improve its STEM education. It will usher in a new pedagogical approach to teaching and learning that is culturally and experientially responsive and relevant, and will ultimately bring about a new age of human and economic development that seems far from rich on the continent. Thank you. Hi, my name is Julie Sabader. My background is in biomedical engineering, which I have a bachelor's degree in. This year, I started in WPI Science and Technology for Innovation and Global Development Master's Program where I have been working on bringing more perspectives like the social sciences to my professional portfolio. For my master's project, I'm conducting a participant observation study of what transdisciplinary research and design look like across discipline and culture. To do this, I am working with a team of undergraduate students working on their senior thesis. The goal of this project is to develop a prototype of a blood pressure monitor that is manufactured locally with e-waste, is inexpensive, and something people will wear. Dr. Kwame Bodu, an obstetrician and hospital director from Kumasi, Ghana, came to us with this idea, and he has remained one of our collaborators. In particular, we imagine the wearable blood pressure monitor will be available for Ghanaian women through their midwife or doctor, who are high risk for developing preeclampsia. This transdisciplinary project consists of biomedical engineers, business students, and a student from the social sciences, as well as faculty representing each discipline. Transdisciplinary work includes bringing together people from different disciplines and backgrounds to work collaboratively towards a shared goal. It requires each partner to understand each other's roles in the project and respect the different perspectives that each of them bring. Partners must practice active and empathic listening so that they can learn each member's assumptions about the project, the key entry points into the work, work style, and project expectations. This allows each person to bring their strengths to the table. Compared to a senior undergraduate project with just engineering majors of the same discipline, this project goes beyond the technical process of developing a medical device. Through co-design and transdisciplinary collaboration, the students were able to assess business, technical, sustainable, and cultural considerations in their design process. Let's look at three key facts. Pregnancy-induced hypertension or preeclampsia affects 19 to 40% of maternal morbidity and deaths in Ghana. Preeclampsia is the second direct cause of maternal mortality worldwide. Pregnancy-induced hypertension can lead to the more serious condition of preeclampsia. Ghana hosts the largest e-waste site in Africa, with about 150,000 tons of e-waste being imported annually. E-waste processors are an underutilized resource with substantial intellectual property. There's opportunity here. Given the experience that I've gained through my coursework and this project, I see multiple benefits that can come from designing, manufacturing, and distributing home blood pressure monitors. It will support healthier lives of women and their children, both born and unborn. Repurposing e-waste in this way generates value that will remain in the Ghanaian economy rather than being exported elsewhere. And it helps more people realize their own agency in designing beneficial outcomes using their own assets. Having this background, I've been able to sympathize and understand the engineering side of the project, as well as the more social aspects of the project along with code design. Initially, engineers geared towards just going straight into solving a problem and developing the device, which I say from my own experience in past projects and have observed in this medical device project so far. This process has encouraged the students to take time to determine the need through background research and interviews, including the opinions of the stakeholders in the process along with having cultural awareness, considering both the history and current structures in place in Ghana. This work also prepares the students for real world situations in the workplace where collaboration across disciplines may be required. Observing the process of transdisciplinary work in a medical device project has allowed me to see the difficulties, changes of mindset and team progression from an outside perspective, preparing me as well for future projects and additionally, I get to learn from the students. Transdisciplinary work can provide a well-rounded perspective to engineering projects, encouraging impactful work that will last and empowering the users through co-design, while also preparing the students for the future. 
Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Julian Bennett. I'm the Department Coordinator for the Mechanical and Industrial and Systems Engineering Department at Economic City University College, ACUC for short. Now, some of you might already know that ACUC has been in collaboration with WPI on a couple of projects. I remember my first encounter with WPI was about two years ago when my boss, Dr. Lucia Japon, asked me to accompany a team of students from ACUC to Achim Junasi where Rob and his team of students from WPI were already stationed and working on a couple of projects. They, I think there was one team working on a bridge build and another looking at developing uh, teaching aids for a school there. Um, so that was one interesting project I was a part of. I also happened to be a part of a project last year. There was an uh, e-waste co-design competition involving students from WPI and students from ACUC working in conjunction with the e-waste processes at the agriculture site. So we're looking at ways to enhance what they do there to increase the income they earn as well as reduce any ill effects those having the, the operations we're having on them. Um, now, these are all part of a grander development engineering vision that WPI has for improving the way development is done in the global south. And this is where my PhD comes in. So uh, I'm pursuing a PhD with WPI, which involves using energy conversion systems with the help of a Stirling engine as a catalyst for the development of smart systems in the villages. Now, um, the Stirling engine was chosen for its design versatility as well as the variety of fuels it can be made to operate on. A Stirling engine can be made as small or small enough to fit into a tabletop radio set. It can also be built to the size of a generator type engine. Uh, it can also be built into the shape of a solar panel, so it takes the heat or radiation from the sun or converts the heat or radiation from the sun into sol into energy that can be used in a home. Um, and so for, for this reason, we are, we are hoping to use this as a, a catalyst for the development of smart systems, kind of like the way the steam engine served as a catalyst in the Industrial Revolution, but this time with some generative justice. And we're hoping to teach the local people how to build these systems. And then another desirable is to use locally sourced materials. So that makes it easy for them to work with and then spread the design all around their local area. Thank you. So uh, good afternoon to everyone in Africa and morning uh, to those in the US. Um, my name is Wale Shobuejo and I have to say it's been a real pleasure just to listen in on the talks and, and learn a lot about the different programs that uh, are going on at WPI and in other places. I, I wanna use this opportunity to thank uh, uh, Dean of the Global School, Mimi Scheller, uh, Rob Kruger, the director of INSTEAD, Baton Somas, Ambassador Bauer, and all of the organizers of, of this session uh, for, for just the great work that was done in, in bringing this uh, program together. Um, I, I must also really appreciate the work of Rachel Roy, who quietly, along with other members of the provost office, have just done such a wonderful job in bringing us together in this forum. As I listen to, to the talks um, and I sort of try to absorb the opportunities here, I, I was inspired by the words of Professor Leonard Wanchakon, who in his talk really talked about a vision of innovation and development. Um, I want to thank uh, Professor Wanchukun for taking the time to share with us his vision. And as a colleague of Professor Wanchukun that spent many years with him at Princeton, it's been a delight to watch him build 
um, this interdisciplinary approach uh, at the African School of Economics and the various programs on innovation that he has spearheaded at Princeton. And I look forward to exploring opportunities for us to collaborate with WPI bringing our own flavor of research and projects to, to work with teams at Princeton in ways that we hope will be mutually beneficial. I, I also want to thank all of the collaborators from all over the world that tuned in to be part of today's event. Um, to Zarina Patel from UCT and uh, others from other places. Uh, I really appreciate just the depth of the collaboration. I'm particularly struck also by the growing interaction with Academic City College. Academic City College is, is a really special place and we're proud to have the collaboration we have with you. Um, for many of you who may not know this, uh, Fred Mabugulori, who is the president and provost of Academic City College was my PhD student many, many years ago. And I'm truly delighted to see the work that's been done by Fred and the team in Academic City College and the mutual benefit to our institutions that's arising from, from the collaborations. And, and, and as we look to the future, building on the interest of our faculty, our postdocs, and our colleagues across Africa and WPI, we're excited about the scaling of the interactions between our efforts in Africa and our efforts here in the US. Ghana, for example, today is an exemplar with Ambassador Bafo Ajebawa and the team with uh, folks uh, like Rob Kruger and all of the WPI team really working to translate our projects in e-waste education into projects that we hope will have a, a larger impact on Ghana and also beyond Ghana, a larger impact on Africa and the rest of the world. We're also struck by the possibilities that we can imagine that could occur when we start having collaborations between the African School of Economics, led by Professor Wanchukon and his team, and our team with our focus on STEM. So we see these opportunities for scaling in Africa, the kinds of activities that build on the grassroots interests of our faculty, our staff, and our students. And we really wanna thank all of you, all the Global Lab students, all our faculty, all our staff, Dean Mimi Scheller and Associate Dean Kent Rismiller and Rob Kruger for leading our Africa team in ways that I think have shown forth uh, very, very brightly from today's activities. And to our guests tuning in from all over Africa and all parts of the world, we thank you for your support and we thank you for attending this uh, session. Thank you very much.